We good? Can we start? Hey, everybody. Afternoon. Can you hear me okay at the back? Right? Sounds good. Thank you. Th thank you for joining. Um, I'm Francesco. I'll introduce myself momentarily. For now, I would like to thank James McLeod, who is walking out, and Gabriele and all the Finos guys for organizing such another amazing event here in New York. Um, welcome to Cloud Native Security Operations from Observability to Response. Abdullah Garcia from JPMC, my co-speaker, couldn't make it today, so it's just me. Uh, who am I? I joined the ranks of the European government in 2011. I was in charge of uh, data security, network security, system hardening and system assurance for them. And then in 2015, I moved to Imarsat, a global satellite mobile provider. Uh, I was chief security engineer for the Satellite Control Center. And then I uh, moved as head of security operations engineering. So my team would basically, well, we, build, we build a SOC. We build a global SOC for the organization and my team was in charge of the technology stack uh, that enabled uh, security operations. And then I expanded my role, I became head of security engineering, uh, so a larger team also was uh, acting as internal consultants for the organization business units on their projects. And then uh, in 2021, I didn't want to see a data center again in my whole life, so I joined Control Plane, where I am a security engineering manager. Control Plane is a cloud native, uh, security consultancy established in 2017, uh, headquartered in London, but we operate globally. A little over 50 people, our clients include governments, financial services, that's why we're here, and regulated industries. Specialists in Kubernetes containers, and but in general cloud security. Um, we consult on zero trust uh, architecture design and assurance, uh, DevSecOps uh, infrastructure and application delivery, hardening of system and software development life cycle, supply chains, plus uh, filling the gap between cloud native infrastructure and security operations centers, and running maturity assessments on security operations for organizations. And then uh, we do a lot of pen testing, pen testing of uh, Kubernetes, uh, CI CD pipelines in general, supply chains, but also blue, red, and purple team uh, offerings. Uh, open source contributions and community outreach uh, our CEO, Andy Martin, who is right there in the audience, uh, is the co-chair for the security tag for CNCF. Uh, also, we did a lot of work within the financial services user, user group, where we uh, developed and released the Kubernetes threat model and associated attack trees. Then we are still a member of Finos, obviously, and we have a large presence in the CCC initiative as well as, again, our CEO, Andy Martin, is the pro bono CISO for Open UK. Right, uh, <clears throat> Abdullah, again, who couldn't make it today, uh, is a senior lead cybersecurity architect in a finance industry. Um, he likes security architecture, enterprise software supply chain security, enterprise SaaS security, security risk, domain threat analysis, and control strategy. He's also a neuroscientist that makes him much more intelligent than I am. Plus, he likes photography, traveling, and uh, cooking. Right, what are we going to talk about today? We'll start from the basics, recapping what's uh, incident response, the 101, the, 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 the very basic, to make sure everybody's on the same page to then appreciate uh, the rest of the talk. We'll then see how organizations had to move from a reactive approach to responding to threats to a more proactive approach to responding to threats, maturing so into something called intelligence-driven defense. And then from there, we'll uh, start talking about uh, responding to threats on cloud native infrastructure, um, the security observability challenges, uh, and uh, the incident response practices uh, to best respond to events on cloud infrastructure, as well as a walkthrough of a actual incident. And then we'll leave with key takeaways. Again, apologies to the security professionals in the room. We have to start from the very basics. So, here are two definitions of an incident and associated response. Uh, you can find many definitions out there. These are the ones I like the most. And find the ones that work for your organization and make sure everybody's on the same page. An incident is an event that could lead to the loss of or disruption to an organization's operations, data, services, or functions. A security incident is an event that may indicate that an organization's system or data have been compromised or that measures put in place to protect them have failed. Response, a set of people, 
process and technology to identify, contain, eliminate, uh, and recover from such events. And let's start from this uh, triad, people, process, and technology. What do I mean? Healthy security operations are supported by these three pillars. People, find the right people, put them in the right seats. Analysts, tier one, tier two, tier three. Engineers, uh, supporting the technology. Forensic guys, those are the ones that find the clues in an attack. And then, unfortunately, managers as well. They have to coordinate at some point. Processes, uh, define your response runbooks and test them. Um, identify how you want to ingest threat intelligence and disseminate this threat intelligence to your uh, policy enforcement points. Or how to contain threats across your whole estate as well as how you want to gather evidence associated to an attacker, and how you want to have stand up the communication paths within the organization to make sure everybody is reachable when needed to. And then technology, sustainable technology. Uh, you have the good old sensors, they still work. Uh, IPS, intrusion prevention systems, uh, uh, EDR, endpoint detection and response capabilities, as well as cloud native sensors. Um, such as tools like open source tools like Falcor or the cloud provider specific uh, capabilities uh, such as CloudTrail or VPC flow logs, as well as log collection and processing using uh, security incident and event management platforms or SIEM, as well as automation technology as we will see later to respond to threats in an automated fashion. The good news is that there are existing frameworks out there to support an organization in uh, uh, defining and coordinating and executing their incident response. Uh, here we have two, one is from NIST, one is from SANS. For the sake of this presentation, I will be focusing on NIST, although they are broadly similar. Uh, uh, NIST is articulated over four steps. Preparation is where an organization must ensure they have no visibility gaps on the infrastructure, they have uh, well-trained teams uh, and well-rehearsed response playbooks or runbooks. In step two is when there is an anomaly detected. Something suspicious comes up in one of the platforms. Um, how do we then analyze it uh, to label the threat as a false positive or a true positive? Upon labeling something as a true positive, uh, the actual response uh, kicks in. You have a procedures to contain the threat. And again, imagine this has to be across your whole estate, no matter what the system is, the affected system is. And then the following bit is to eradicate the threat and recover, if, and recover from the threat. And then in step four, you ask yourself, how the hell this happened? How can we avoid this happening again in the future? Right, these were the basics. Let's talk about the more advanced stuff. So at some point, uh, maybe a couple of decades ago, industry realized that uh, a reactive approach to responding to security threats was no longer enough because they were dealing now with motivated adversaries. So instead, the incident response had to adopt something called a kill chain perspective, um, which is a step-by-step -step approach that identifies and stops enemy activity as soon as possible. It's no longer a reactive process, but instead is proactive, and we'll see how in a bit. Implements intent-based response and the proverbial behavior-based uh, detection to get a step ahead of the adversaries. Although it is critical to have the right intelligence about your adversaries, right? Because if you don't know how they operate, uh, how can you stop them? So it's critical to have the indicators of compromise, where these indicators of compromise, uh, compromise uh, in security operations consist of uh, clues, technical uh, bits and pieces that can show signs of enemy activity. Because bottom line is all about knowing your enemy. And uh, I swear to myself many times, Francesco, you shall not put any quote from the art of war in this presentation, but I miserably failed. So Sun Tzu in the art of war said, if you know your enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of 100 battles. But equally, one of the greatest bands in the world uh, said the same, know your enemy. So, you know, they must be right because it is indeed about knowing your enemy. But how do you get to your, your enemy? They may operate in a number of ways. Well, you don't have to worry about it. 
because our friends in defense at Lockheed years ago came up with something called the cyber kill chain because they identified that broadly an attacker, an attack is performed following seven steps. Reconnaissance of the target, weaponization, delivery of a malicious payload, exploitation of an asset or a system, installation and establishing presence, command and control to then further move inside the infrastructure to get to your crime jewels and um, effectively have access to the real target. So now we know that these are the seven steps. So we are gaining understanding that we can proactively kill this attack chain at some point, right? So if you install an antivirus, it's because you hope to block them at exploitation, uh, at ex exploitation stage. Um, or if you do a lot of network defense, uh, you're trying to contain threats when they are uh, perhaps being uh, controlled from the outside world uh, at the command and control step. The tricky bit is that these bad guys, they have thousands of ways uh, to perform each step, each of the seven steps. And again, how do you counterattack? How do you gain that knowledge of how they operate? Again, you don't have to, because our friends at Mitri put together something called the Attack Framework, a taxonomy of known tactics and techniques, uh, again, how these bad guys can sneak into your organizations. So tactics are the adversary's tactical objective for performing an action. Techniques represent how an adversary achieves a tactical objective by performing an action. So now we know they follow a certain number of steps to breach, to breach your organization, and tactics and techniques uh, are known, somewhat known. Uh, what's left? Well, you still have to do your homework and obtain intelligence. The intelligence can be open source, which is available, widely available to everybody, or can be, or can be industry specific. Anne from City was here this morning. She's, uh, I think she's the chair of the FS ISAC or the Financial Services Information Sharing and Analysis Committee. In the past, I was a member of the Aviation ISAC with a pre previous job. And these communities, uh, they can provide really tailored uh, intelligence for your, because they share your same threat landscape, right? Financial institutions. What are the threat actors, how they operate? Right, so we know that we have, they operate in a certain way. Tactics and techniques are broadly um, familiar. We have intelligence. What's left? Well, we need to find a way to counterattack. We can't have people behind a keyboard typing commands as an, attack, uh, as an attack goes on, because they're simply not fast enough. But again, we don't have to worry about it, because intelligence-driven defense is supported by something called SOAR, or Security Orchestration Automation and Response, which is a technology stack. There are proprietaries out there. There are some open source out there. You can build your own. And it's a tech stack that enables your organization to collect data about security threats, that proverbial intelligence, and respond to security events with little or no human assistance. Effectively, what you do is you take your instant response runbooks and you code them in a number of steps that a machine performs for you. Obviously, this machine needs access to your infrastructure, so least privilege and RBAC, all that good stuff still applies. But this technology stack can literally, as we will see later, stop an attack before they cause too much damage. And SOAR focuses on three domains, threat and vulnerability management, security incident response, and security operations automations. But the two cornerstones are simply preparation and automation. Preparation, if you have blind spots and visibility gaps on your estate, you simply can't detect threats as well as if you receive uh, millions of events as per second and you don't fine tune the analysis of these events coming from your state, uh, uh, too much noise. You get the, the, the important stuff gets lost. As well as uh, up-to-date uh, incident response runbooks, well rehearsed as well. As well as running tabletop exercises. For those of you who don't know, tabletop exercises are Dungeons and Dragons style um, threat scenarios walkthrough that you do with your incident responders as well as the, be, the key people in your business to test your readiness uh, to respond to actual threats. And then if you're a 
fairly technical organization, you may want to choose to run also an adversary emulation exercise. We do that for customers. So we impersonate a threat, uh, um, but that, you know, a threat actor from the organizational threat landscape. We literally mimic what they would do, and we see if the uh, security operations center can detect it. The, uh, the activity. Automation, an appropriate tech stack, sustainable technology that your guys know about. A dedicated engineering function, don't try to give an analyst uh, an engineering job and vice versa. Well-coded runbooks, uh, incident response runbooks uh, coded into the technology, as well as selective view interaction because sometimes uh, you need the humans. Very well, so basics, then we move to something more advanced. Now let's talk about uh, cloud native incident response. And I would like to start from the challenges. In particular, cloud native uh, is quite new. It is quite new uh, and complex. It's yet another stack uh, on top of your, of your infrastructure, right? Um, there is a significant skill gap within the incident responding responders community because it's just too fast paced. They can't keep up with the amount of features and things that come up in cloud native. Um, you have to deal with volatility and scaling. And also it's very difficult to get observability right because again, the skill gaps. So you have the poor forensics guys trying to achieve to get to a container to, for example, obtain a forensic image. This container is long gone because of the uh, auto scaling uh, um, capabilities of cloud native. However, cloud native, there are significant adva advantages as well. Cloud native platforms are really well suited to be designed, deployed, and operated using the everything as code paradigm, as well as they provide you with the ability of uh, um, introducing declarative as well as imperative way of man commanding your infrastructure. So they are very suitable for automation because it's all API based, right? And in particular, modern applications or running on containers um, on runtimes uh, like Kubernetes, uh, they bring even more advantages to the table. For example, containerization itself uh, is pretty cool because you have, from a trusted source, uh, you have an immutable image that you can run on your Kubernetes cluster providing fast providing multiple replaceable instances of the same application. As well as Kubernetes brings uh, significant advanced orchestration capabilities uh, for your applications. As well as fully embracing the GitOps paradigm. So you don't really need to give uh, access to humans directly to infrastructure. Everything is commanded and controlled uh, um, through uh, version control uh, configuration files uh, or infrastructure definition documents. And Kubernetes uh, has a native uh, capability called operators uh, that basically can do work for you on your behalf uh, and again can be controlled uh, as we will see later uh, not giving access directly to your runtime but through uh, something called custom resource definition very well these next three slides come from my co-speaker abdullah and just you know um, i don't i'm just gonna read that out loud uh, because you know just a sign of respect to him so in terms of getting observability right uh, on, in cloud native, uh, comprehending the technology and being well-versed uh, in the associated security best practices, uh, while essentials, it is not sufficient. It is equally important to possess an understanding of the intended utilization of the technology, so the use cases, as well as uh, it is necessary for a representative from the SOC, and I may add uh, more than one, to actively participate uh, and be present during the architectural design phase of the technology utilization. And it is critical to comprehend the required sources of logging for the security operations center and ascertain the means by which the satisfaction of operational prerequisites can be guaranteed. The message is, if your incident responders are not involved in your system or software development life cycle since the early stages, they don't know what they're defending from they don't know what they're defending. So involve them and make sure that whatever you are building, the security operations center have visibility of uh, events uh, occurring on the platform that you are building. Enough of the theory, let's look at a more technical example. This is going to be a quite simplified uh, incident response walkthrough. 
But as we go through the different steps of the NIST framework, I would I really like to highlight the cloud native wins. So we see why responding to, uh, to, to, to threats on cloud native infrastructure definitely has some advantages. Right, step one of the NIST incident response um, framework is all about preparation. And here I have good news. So today we are, uh, Abdullah and I are open sourcing uh, a threat library for Kubernetes. You can access it uh, through that QR code it was crafted by our, again, uh, long-term friend, uh, Abdullah from JPMC, but it was then fused uh, with the content from control planes, internal threat libraries. And the library, it does one thing, well, it does many things, but predominantly achieves one goal. A security operation center obtains full visibility on the Kubernetes runtime, so they know how to respond to threats. The library is supported by a really cool diagram, I know it's complex, but you can download, you can probably see it from here, but you can download it from the repository. The, the, the library includes threat actors, threat objects, attack vectors, um, assumptions for the, for the attacks, and uh, controls. So for each of the key Kubernetes uh, components, we list uh, threats, and these threats are mapped back to the attack framework. So if you want to maintain always that narrative, you can as well as providing the controls uh, that you, as organizations, must implement to make sure that the security operations center receive uh, their visibility on a cluster. So receive uh, logs at the appropriate uh, verbosity level. Again, open sourced uh, today, feel free to, to grab a copy. So preparation phase uh, done. We, have, we are reasonably sure as responders that we have good visibility on the infrastructure and our runbooks are well coded into our automation response system, or SOAR system. So something at some point uh, kicks in. It's an alert, an anomaly. And the anomaly is generated by a number of logs. The logs can come from cloud native, the, the library itself, as well as from the traditional sensors like firewalls or EDR. Now, this example um, is about a allegedly compromised workload on your cluster. So the event is confirmed as suspicious, not a true positive yet, is suspicious, and therefore is uh, <clears throat> escalated to our security orchestration, automation, and response platform. So the cloud native runbook is then activated. We then need to move to anal analyzing the threat. Right? The threat, again, in the context of a compromised low, um, workload, the, play, the runbook may say you need to profile the attack and you need to gather the indicator of compromise from the, from the threat. And a, <clears throat> a runbook may say initiate a full packet capture, verbosely logging north-south but equally east-west traffic, initiating a process analysis, uh, uh, grab a copy of the process tree, understand what executables are involved uh, in, the, in the attack or in the alleged attack, uh, as well as take an early forensic snapshot of the potentially compromised asset, uh, in this case a workload, uh, because you never know. You might want to replay the attack and see what happened. And if you are a slightly more advanced uh, organization, you may want to then selectively redirect connections from that same IP or whatever, from that same source uh, to production-like forensic workstations to harvest even more indicator of compromise. At the end of the, um, well, before I move to the end of the analysis phase, what are the cloud native wins in executing a RAM book uh, such that one? First of all, Kubernetes, you can attach a stealth debug container with network and process forensic tools directly to the alleged compromised workload. That is pretty uh, impossible to detect from an attacker standpoint, as well as you can use uh, checkpointing and restoring native Kubernetes capabilities uh, on the suspicious workload, grabbing a forensic copy, maybe sending it somewhere, re-executing it in a sandbox environment uh, to further analyze the workload. And then you can, of course, reconfigure ingress on the fly to selectively redirect uh, uh, connections from that uh, potentially malicious source uh, to forensic workstations. At the end of the analysis phase, we say, yes, this is a true positive. And with true positive uh, means we want to contain the threat. And the runbook says, reduce the blast radius. 
And you do that how? Depends, in this case, by blocking north-south traffic, trying to avoid data exfiltration to occur, block east-west traffic to avoid lateral movement, but equally pushing all the indicator of compromises you gathered from the attack to all the policy enforcement points. Because at that point, if you do so, you have a high chance you kill the attack chain and you prevent uh, further damage. And again, if you are an advanced, uh, I don't like to say advanced, if you are a particularly security cautious organization, you may want uh, to respond the entire application on a hardened runtime. This is pretty useful when sometimes you deal with zero days. You have an understanding how the attack is being performed, uh, but you don't have the full picture. So at the cost of, a with a performance cost, uh, a performance impact, uh, you may want to respond the entire application on hardened runtime. Again, that's what the runbook says. What are the cloud native wins using runtimes like Kubernetes? Well, in one single command, you freeze the orchestration for the whole uh, deployment. As well as uh, one command, you remove the compromised workload from the deployment. So you start isolating that compromised workload. And then you apply a default um, deny all network policy. So you block north-south and east-west uh, communication from that compromised workload. And uh, again, because you can run multiple runtimes on the same cluster nodes, you can move the entire application on a hardened runtime. Very well. Eradication. The runbook says for a compromised workload, uh, we want to clean up. We want to remove uh, the compromised entity from our deployment, from our cluster. As well as if you are a little paranoid and you uh, perhaps deal with a zero day and you, may, you suspect that there could be a compromise of the underlying infrastructure, aka the, the cluster nodes, you may want to rebuild the whole thing. Again, that's what the runbook says. How does it work in the cloud native? What are the wins? To remove the compromised workload is one command and the pod is recycled, is gone. As well as you can drain the entire cluster node of all the running workloads, so then you can rebuild it with infrastructure as code. <clears throat> and it don't, doesn't take long at all. After the threat is uh, hopefully eradicated, we want to move to recovery. The recovery phase, uh, the runbook says, you want to restore normal service. The good thing is that, <clears throat> excuse me, in cloud native, everything we have been doing so far doesn't really alter service levels. Because as soon as we were you know, moving away the pod from the deployment, whatever we were doing on the workload, uh, Kubernetes uh, was reconciling the state uh, of the application to the desired one. So it took care of restoring the application on our behalf, and we didn't have to do anything. So very likely nothing really alters service levels. So the steps I mentioned so far, I keep talking about automation, but the steps mentioned so far was a bunch of commands. How do we execute them? We don't want a human to type them, right? We don't have to, because again, we can leverage cloud native capabilities in Kubernetes, like the operators. Operators are, they extend the cube standard functionality. They can automate and streamline the execution of security incident response procedures. They fully embrace the GitOps paradigm. So the security automation platform doesn't really need to access the cluster directly. They operate the, the, the operator through um, modifying resources held uh, on a version control repository. So least privilege all the way. As well as you can implement uh, native Kubernetes role-based access control to ensure that the operator has the least amount of permissions needed to perform those actions, and that's it. Fully embracing the least privilege paradigm. How would that look like? You have your automation platform as well as humans. They can interact with, uh, um, with your version control system to modify custom resources. Custom resources, basically, they can be used to control uh, what the operator does on uh, the Kubernetes API. Again, uh, under the constraints of the Kubernetes role-based access control model you put in place for your operator. Very well, time to wrap up. What are the key takeaways? In cloud native incident response, 
it's paramount, it's paramount importance to get and train the right people. They know how the technology operates. They, know, they need to know how your systems are developed. You need to then uh, develop and rehearse the right processes, response runbooks. Uh, and they have to be executed in an automated fashion by sustainable technology. Sustainable not only from an environment standpoint, as well as, but predominantly from a skill set point of view. People need to know how the technology works. It is absolutely critical to get security observability right. So no blind spots on the infrastructure. If you can't see it, uh, you can't detect it, uh, so you can't protect from that. As well as taking full advantage of cloud native capabilities uh, gives you really an edge against the adversaries. And again, uh, bottom line is automate, automate, automate as much as you can. I'd also like to leave you with a book written by, surprise, surprise, our CEO Andy Martin, um, was published by O'Reilly, Hacking Kubernetes, a goldmine of uh, information on how to secure, as well as break into Kubernetes clusters. You can get the first half of the book for free by scanning the QR code there. And thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? Either now or later, please. On that, on that takeaway slide where you said um, about knowing everything that's happening in that space, is that like, would the policy be to pipe all your logs into a central place because sometimes containers will be destroyed and recreated so, like, so that you can like reconstruct the stuff forensically? So it was like a central repository that you then use, is that right? So, Fine-tuning the event collection is key, and you want to do that as close as possible to the source, so you don't saturate networks. And you want to preserve a copy of, that, of those logs somewhere. Now, in, a, in a large organizations, typically you adopt a hybrid SIEM approach. So you leverage the cloud-native capabilities like AWS whatever, Google Cloud whatever, and you collect logs there, and then your on-prem security operations center SIEM can connect to those sources of information to then asynchronously go through the logs and pass them and build a bigger picture. And then you can have different retention depending on. And then when you say automate, is there uh, a, a specific tool that you need that you recommend for automation or uh, a mix and match of whatever it is? So, I'm not going to say names because I use the commercial tools in the past, but as well as uh, we help organizations building their open source based tool stack. Uh, and I'd love to tell you more maybe later if you want to stick around. Um, so say, for example, that you have a, a, an unusually high number of administrative connections to a, an asset. And maybe this asset, uh, nobody has ever accessed from an, an administrative standpoint that access in the, in that asset in the past uh, three weeks. And this happens at 2 a.m. So your SIEM would have a rule saying, if you have more than this amount of connections in 10 minutes, and this happens outside of business hours, and this asset was never accessed in the past month, Maybe that's suspicious, or maybe that's actually a legitimate connection because the system is breaking or, and they have to troubleshoot something. But those are the rules uh, that you can set up. In Cloud Native, is especially if you download the library, the um, Kubernetes for SOC library, it's quite interesting to see the rules that you have to put in place uh, to effectively monitor against threats on Kubernetes because the intricacies of how Kubernetes work. Pleasure. Thank you. Anything else? Right, thank you again.